Despite this video technically being a bit late compared to last year, I did still want to do my top 10 countdown for what I believe the most notable, the most useful, perhaps just the coolest, or maybe even favourite 10 cars brought to GT7 in the previous year were. Of course, last January I did that for 2022, and this time we're looking back at 2023. Now, this list will disappoint some people, not because any of the cars I've picked are bad per se, but because there are some really iconic ones that are not featured here, some really high demand ones that aren't featured here, but of course you have to narrow it down to 10. Over 30 cars were added, and of course we are going to dive into it. And to get into my honourable mentions, which alone will annoy a lot of people, stuff like the Mercedes 190E, of course super iconic, the Nismo 400R, the Demon Challenger, the Porsche 992 shape, GT3 RS, of course the classic Challenger, the GTR Nismo of the R32 shape, and even some debuts like the Citroen DS for example, and the Porsche 904. None of those are in my top 10, and I know that will disappoint some people, so what is in my top 10? Well, for my list, I'm actually not counting down to my favourite, I'm counting them through in terms of chronologically through the year. So the earliest one that we received, walking through to the latest. And by that metric, number 10 on my list is actually going to be the Honda Grand Prix car. The 1965 Honda RA272. Now the reason for this one being here is twofold. Number one, I think that classic racers, classic Grand Prix, is always going to be a fantastic addition to any racing game because it's so easy to overlook it. They're not necessarily always the easiest to drive or the most popular, but the fact that this one doesn't have too ridiculous of a price tag, in fact it's quite modest, this is actually genuinely a brilliant car for cash cow events and it's just a wonderful car to drive. The next one on the list is also a race car, and another one which I'm primarily putting on here because of what it represents. The Audi RS5 Turbo DTM. DTM cars have been sorely lacking in Gran Turismo recently. We've had a couple of classic icons, of course the Alpha 155 probably most notably from day one, and of course we've had a couple of road-going obligations like Mercedes 190e, the BMW E30, but in terms of actual race cars, especially on the newer side of things, Gran Turismo has always been very hit and this. It used to have some cool ones, the CLK, the Astra, the Calibra, but then it kind of went away. I also like the fact that this is sort of a throwback to the most recent DTM car that we previously had, the 2004 Audi A4. Next one on the list is a bit more of a novelty pick, and I do actually have at least two novelty picks on the list. You can probably guess what one of them is going to be. This one, though, is the Toyota Alphard. Some people will hate the fact that this is on here, and hate the other one that I've picked even more probably, but the reason why I like this is because it shows that at least to some degree, they haven't completely lost that magic that Gran Turismo used to have. There are plenty of things which I will still criticise, plenty of things which need to be improved, or at least reconsidered in terms of delivering the community at large what they want and not having so much drop off from the game, but having vehicles like this does harken back to the older days of Gran Turismo, where they would have cars kind of just for the sake of it, just weird stuff. But that isn't the only reason why it's here. As with the other novelty vehicle that I'll talk about in a bit, this one is genuinely useful. And if you haven't tried out the Alphard, if you haven't tuned it, if you maybe don't think it's that great of a car, try the tune setup that I did on the channel a while back. This thing is a weapon. It's deceptively good. I'm still crossing my fingers and toes that we get an engine swap for it at some point, but even if we don't, this is a deceptively good car, and I love the fact that it is actually not only interesting, but useful. The next one is a car which, to be completely honest, I haven't used that much since I first talked about it and, you know, did some tuning for it, but it's such an iconic car, it was such an important one to add. For me, it was between the Porsche 959 and this one. Ultimately, I chose this one because of the legendary factor, kind of just outclassing a little bit the Porsche 959, and I am, of course, referring to one of its main rivals, the former fastest car in the world, Jaguar's XJ220, for a couple of reasons. One, hugely requested car from the community. Number two, the first time ever having a premium XJ220. Plus, it's easy to forget this, but the XJ220 has been around in Gran Turismo from almost day one. Even as far back as Gran Turismo 2, it was a properly quick car. It is a legend within the series and in real life. And for me personally, another reason why I've got it on the list, and some of you will know this if you know my taste in cars, the fact that you can turn it into the TWR version is a huge bonus on top of an already excellent car. The next one I think will probably feature on most people's lists, maybe even the vast majority, and for many people I could see this being perhaps even your single favourite car of the entire year, and it is one hell of a car in terms of how OP it is, I would actually argue that this car kind of is the Tommy Kyra ZZ2 of Gran Turismo 7, 
I am of course referring to the Aston Martin Valkyrie. The Valkyrie is insanely OP for a road car with active aero, Formula One meets LMP tech, incredible power level, especially when you tune it. And although it's not the quickest in a straight line necessarily, it more than makes up for that in terms of grip, cornering, acceleration, braking. It's a ridiculously good car. And I think we probably will get some more like this, like maybe the AMG Project 1, etc. in future. But for now, this thing kind of feels like it's in a class of its own. It's so ridiculously far ahead of every other supercar, pretty much. Certainly every other road-going supercar. And it does remind me, as I said, of how OP the Tommy Car is at 2 used to be. And certainly how OP, although inaccurately so, the Ferrari FXX used to be. Although that should have never been allowed into road car events anyway, but there you go. Of course, with me being me, this one had to be on the list. It's my favourite brand, and of course it's a supercar, which I always have a soft spot for. This one, I would have never guessed, to be honest, would come to the game. Certainly not this quickly, I guess you could say, after it being released. The Maserati MC20. I feel like some people may have a little bit of disappointment when you first jump into this car, because it's maybe a little bit heavier through corners, a little bit more slippery than you might expect. But to me, I think this car is actually what many players were kind of expecting the C8 Corvette to be. The C8 was by far the most requested car. And then, now that players have got it, I barely see anyone using them, and barely anyone talking about them. Whereas with this car, it seems like it's a car that has increased people's love and interest in Maserati. That's exactly what a game has the power to do when done right. And for me as a Maserati superfan, of course I'm happy to see that. And again, although I don't use the MC20 every day or anything, it is a very versatile supercar, it's a hell of a good road car, and although it's not anywhere near the same level as the Valkyrie, on more of a super sports car kind of level, low-end supercar stuff, it, it is a weapon. It's a very good one to use. And some pretty nice visual upgrades as well. The next one on the list could be controversial, but I think this might be one of the ones where the more you think about it, the more it kind of makes sense. It's probably the only time a Corolla will be on the same list as something like a Valkyrie and an MC20, but for me, actually, genuinely, one of the best additions this year was the Toyota GR Corolla. This thing is fantastic, and the thing that really clued me into just how good this is, is when I actually did a special projects pack featuring this one as a semi-replica of the WRC spec version of what this car would be like in the game. That thing, despite having no way near the horsepower of many of the rally builds that I've done before, can run rings around many of them. This is a genuinely brilliant car off-road. One of the single most enjoyable rally car builds in the game, one of my favourites that I've ever done, and it's a brilliant car both on and off-road. I have no doubt it's phenomenal to drive in real life. I haven't driven one yet, or the Yaris for that matter, but two fantastic little cars showing that Toyota, I mean, it's about time they got back into doing stuff like this again, and boy, did they come back with a bang. The next one, though, keeping it to Toyota, is going to be the one, if the Alpha didn't annoy you, then this one definitely will, and you already know what it is. The Ambulance, the Toyota High Medic. Why on earth is it on the list? Mostly for the same reasons as the Alphard. It's not necessarily as quick as the Alphard, but the fact that you can still, once again with a Special Projects build proving this, use it really well off-road. I actually used my build from Special Projects recently to do one of the weekly events, which was on the, I believe, Catalonia dirt course layout, and won it with this thing, and it was still a two-ton vehicle. This is so wacky, so different, so alternative, so old-school Gran Turismo. Again, immediately reminds me of stuff like the Pace Cars, the Moon Rover, and although they're not the most useful things around, they're just so nice to have in. They really do, to me, feel like the last dregs of a throwback to a time when games used to have vehicles just because how like Test Drive Unlimited would have the random Audi A4 DTM touring car for no apparent reason, or how Toka would have that secret tank for no apparent reason, and various other games would do that. I really miss that era of having just, you know, because we can vehicles. The fact that this one ties into, I believe, the appreciation Kaz had for when the disasters happened in Japan, I believe it was, and a lot of these vehicles were used to help people. That's a nice tie-in as well, and the fact that you can use it for racing, it's just a pretty nice addition. In a similar vein to the GR Corolla, this next one might surprise you as well. And not to keep tooting my own flute here with special projects, but it was actually a special project which made me realise just how much I really like this car, at least in the game. And for me that's saying a lot, because I've driven a couple of these in real life, of older generations, and I, to be honest, didn't really like them that much. I've driven an FD2 and an FN2, and I wasn't really wowed by it the Civic Type R, but in particular the FL5. The reason why this one won me over so much was initially because this thing really does show, and it could just be the game, but 
I'd like to give them the benefit of the doubt just how far front-wheel drive chassis technology has come. They were already great, I know there are plenty of good ones, but the fact that this car can make a very similar layout to what the Ford Focus RS Mark II used to have into a more accessible platform than the Focus RS Mark II was, again I've driven one, it's a great car, but it was known for its torque steer for example, this Civic, there's none of that, it's just so forgiving, and for a car with this kind of horsepower to even be close to forgiving, that's a remarkable testament to its engineering, and the icing on the cake that really pushed it to the next level for me is when I did that fictional Mugen version. Inspired by the older Mugen Double R, I called it the Mugen Double R Limited. I can't remember which special project pack it was in, but that just took it to the next level. It made it like my imagining of like a Honda equivalent to a Mitsubishi F FQ400 kind of build, and it was so much fun. It's so engaging to drive, so rapid as well. Yet again, it's a build that I made primarily for fun, but I've ended up using it so much in career mode for front-wheel drive events in particular. And yeah, it's just so engaging to drive. It's so much fun. I know there's a bit of a theme here with the Japanese cars feeling really good. The fact that a Civic Type R could ever be on this list is a testament to just how good it is. And of course, last and definitely not least, I feel like if the Aston Martin Valkyrie isn't your number one from this year, then probably the other 2% of people, with some outliers, will probably have this as their number one. A car which, like the C8, was massively requested. You already know exactly what I'm going to say. It's a car which I believe did live up to what we were hoping for. You had to get the sound right, it had to look good. The fact that we can do the aero package to turn it into the other version. I am of course referring to the considerably more expensive now, Lexus LFA. It's not my number one because it's my favourite of the year. It's not. It's my number one here because it was the most recent of the list, as I said. The Lexus LFA was of course such an obvious pick to add to Gran Turismo if you want to keep the community happy. I'll be interested to see if we get any kind of engine swaps. The problem with any kind of swap is it's going to immediately take away a lot of the character of the car, but it's, it's one of those cars which, to me, I actually like for probably a different reason to most people. I feel like most people wanted to race this thing and tune it and listen to it. For me, I like this actually because it's one of those cars that you don't need to add in a game that's just about winning races. Because the LFA categorically is not the cheapest, it's not the quickest, it's not the simplest way of winning a race. Um, Nissan GTR, for example, is nine times out of ten going to be a cheaper, faster option at that level. The reason why I like what this represents is because the LFA is just like a Zonda. It's just like a Spiker. It's just like a number of other of those cars that I adore, including Maserati. And that is that the LFA was built, above all else, to be a driver's car. It was built to be engaging. It was built to be fun. It was built for the pure joy of driving, to the point where Lexus lost money on them. That, to me, is what racing games, and particularly driving games, do best when they do it well. Test Driver Limited is a prime example, just going into that game purely for the joy of driving a particular vehicle that you love. And that's coming from someone who has warmed up to the LFA and didn't necessarily used to love it. I've always been more of an ISF kind of guy, but the LFA is very well represented, and ultimately, it was a stronger year than I think we might be remembering in terms of new cars coming. And as crazy as this probably sounds, especially given what this video is all about, I actually don't know what my favourite was of the year. Because I've picked these, as I said, for a combination of being my favourites and the most significant and also the most useful, kind of those three things put together. So with that in mind, I actually don't know what my favourite pick was. I seem to recall last year the Chiron might have been my favourite new edition, but for this year I'm not entirely sure. I love many of them, but I don't think I necessarily have one key standout for me personally. I'd love to hear your list down below though. If you can't stick to 10, you could always do maybe just your favourite, maybe a top 5, or you could do the entirety of the year, something like 33 vehicles. So choose whatever you want to do, and of course, I'll read it down below. But I'll see you next time with more GT7 content, and of course we'll have to see what 2024 holds. But for now, thanks for watching.